What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Millionaire Voices, episode number 10. Today, I have the honor of interviewing the legendary Dr. Rick Goodman, global guru, motivational speaker, author, and serial entrepreneur. Today, we dive in with Rick to learn about how he's attained so much success in business, how he teaches entrepreneurs with his programs and his coaching, and what it's like to be a speaker and work with professional athletes as a chiropractor and be a successful entrepreneur living a happy life. So tune on in right now. Thanks so much, Danny. And and it's pretty cool for me to be here since... I've known you since before you were born, Mm -hmm. knowing your dad for all these years and you coming to the house and seeing you grow as an entrepreneur. And the thing that I I embrace the most and really enjoy the most is you are a lifelong learner. You just want to suck up that knowledge and share. And what people really need to understand is learning never stops. It continues. And those people that think they know it or they got it all, that's when they start to go the opposite way Mm -hmm. and they start to not succeed. Because, you know, if you're not progressing, you're regressing. So just to see, you know, that energy and to see what you're doing with this is tremendous, you know. So uh, it's it's nice because I've seen what we would call the backstory. Well, (laughs) and, and, and you actually, it's funny you say that because that's exactly why I wanted you to come here, Rick, because, and I, re- I really appreciate those words from someone I look up to in this uh, life thus far, because, and you hit the nail on the head with a lesson right there, and, and I've learned that, is that you have to continuously learn, and that's exactly why I wanted to bring you on this show, where you can really tell people what it's like, and, you know, for me, I think people just got to understand, besides me telling them that, and you could look them up online and know, you know, what and who Dr. Rick Goodman is. But I'm so curious about the backstory from your end, where you come from. And then we can really dive into the business side of it. But where are you from? Well, you know, today I'm going to share some stories that I've absolutely never shared in public with anybody mm-hmm. about uh, my upbringing, what drives me, because my daughter always says to me, well, dad, they don't know the backstory, you know, what you kind of went through. And my daughter didn't know it until we took a trip to Europe and ended up writing a book together, which is another story. But I grew up in Oceanside, Long Island, mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> great town when I grew up there. And I grew up under uh, the control of what I'd call Storm and Norman Goodman, my dad. And so some people out there may have had people tell them that they couldn't do things in life and uh, they weren't good enough or whatnot. And that was usually based on how their references were. And they just didn't know any better. Well, my dad really didn't know any better. So he would say to me all the time, you'll never go to college. All you do is chase skirts and play hockey, you know, or you're not smart or you're stupid or all these things. Now, some people will buy into that. Other people will be the opposite. I'm kind of like George Costanza. So I do the opposite. So Mm -hmm. you can either embrace what other people say or say, I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm a complete prove you wrong person, no matter what it is. So, you know, I kind of embrace that stuff. And started my first job was as a dishwasher at an IHOP at 12 years old because back then you could go work as your if your parents signed for something you can work that that young and then it was at a Wendy's before where's the beef and then one summer I worked as a garbage man in the morning and a lifeguard in the afternoon because it was a political thing so if your parents knew somebody in the town or the county and you can get a job well I would literally get up in the morning at six and I'd get on the back of the garbage truck. And I remember my grandmother always said that that's when she was the most proud of me because it wasn't beneath me to go and pick up someone's garbage, knowing that I eventually was going to be a doctor because that was kind of my path. And it was just about doing the little things and recognizing that in life, Mm -hmm. everybody is important, you know? And I always give the example, if that garbage man didn't come to your house for a week or a month, who would be the most important person in your life that time? It'd be that garbage man. So, you know, I embrace everybody's job as being important and vital because it really is as you go along the route of life and you meet people and recognize that everybody contributes. Did you have those thoughts, at a, you said at an early age, you were already seeing that type of, having that type of compassion and understanding early on? Well, I, I guess I had that compassion and understanding because my 
upbringing was more abusive, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, etc. And again, mm-hmm. you know, you can either embrace that or or not. And and I played hockey, so I was playing hockey and traveling around the world playing hockey. And, oh wow! And one day, I'll never forget. I want. I was 12 years old, sitting on my bed, and I said, I don't want to play anymore. Mm-hmm. And my father came in, and my father had polio. So what happened was he was a baseball player. He was going to be a, a professional baseball player. And he was playing in the city championships in New York. Mm-hmm. And he was supposed to play in a tournament for the weekend in the city. And my grandparents said, no, we want you to, uh, you're coming upstate New York where everybody would go on the weekends. Well, he went upstate New York and he came back. And when he woke up Monday, he couldn't get out of bed. He had polio. Mm. The next day they came out with the vaccine. So... Literally, he couldn't move his legs. One leg was thinner than the other. And and he lived his sports life through me. And he sat on the stood on the bed and his fist was bigger than my face. And he said, you're going to play. You're going to like it. You're not going to quit. Goodman's don't quit. Mm. And I remember I kind of hated him for that. But but it's a lesson that if you ask my children what a Goodman's not doing, they'll say quit. We don't wow. give up. We don't can't. So you never know where those lessons will come. And okay. that lesson even passed through in my time with the Rams, which I could tell you about later, which was another story. And again, it's being the authentic you and we're all, we all have references. Mm-hmm. And the only way we can change our references is by changing our experience. And, you know, just because your references when you grew up and people told you certain things, that doesn't mean it's true. You know, I've even but, had my accountant tell me something the other day, and I had to look at it and say, well, those are his references, but that's not my journey. That's, yeah. My question to you there, Rick, is with the narrative that you're changing, pretty much with this stuff you're saying that was rather negative or abusive or something that's telling that you can't do something, almost making, giving you a limiting mentality, but you had a strength uh, and a, a mental strength to say, you know what, I'm going to prove you wrong. And, and, and you brushed it off. How were you able, you said, were you able to channel in it through hockey? How were you channeling that, do you think, in the sense of people can't brush it off like people weren't brushing it off like you in this world right now? that come from these same backgrounds and they couldn't get to as successful as you because they couldn't brush it off. Well, here's the deal. Uh, you know, I look at someone and say, if they can do it, I can do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I decided to, I was playing hockey in the spectrum in Philadelphia when I was 12 years old. I went head first into the boards, couldn't move my neck. I went home and our family friend came over who was a chiropractor, adjusted me and I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a chiropractor. And it was pretty much as simple as that. That's so cool. You know, when I saw Brian Tracy get up on stage in front of thousands of people mm-hmm. in a success, uh, you know, program, I said, that's what I want to do. And Brian Tracy is the top testimonial on the back of my new book, The Solutions Oriented Leader, and a good friend of mine now. So, you know, you can really achieve anything that you want. Mm-hmm. And it's not what happens to you. It's what you do with it that makes the big difference because we all go through Just, hard mm, times, through failures, mm, uh, through deaths. You know, I've been through every single one of those things. Mm, and, you know, it's not what happens to you. It's what you do with it, you know, and how you look at it. Uh, and that's why I wrote The Solutions Oriented Leader, because anybody could pick out the problems, my children, anybody. But you don't get paid for picking out problems. You get paid for solutions Mm. (laughs) and getting up there and looking down and seeing what we can do to help other people. And that's really kind of what it boils down to Mm. and getting out of yourself, you know. And and that's that's gold right there, because it it allows the person to really just live the best life. (laughs) You know, that's what you're going for. Right. Right. It's really it's it's not predetermined, you know, uh, I remember after my wife passed away, she had cancer for eight out of the 10 years we were married. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the year after that, I always look at my horoscope from the New York Times on my birthday. That's the only day. And this horoscope is in my it's in my book because it basically said that everything in life is up to you. It's your choice. What is it you want to do with your life? Get up and do it and get started today. And it was it spoke to me as it should speak to everybody because it really is a choice. And, you know, once you're done with college and school, you know, your parents aren't there to tell you what to do. You get to choose it. Now, if you allow other people to influence you, well, then that's your own situation. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really respect that because, I mean, look, I, I try to take the approach for people who can't just brush it off like you and tell them, listen, stop beating yourself up because it's not serving you. Look, do what Dr. Rick Goodman did. 
he brushed it off. He just told you about eight things that were pretty big things that are, I would say very you know dark and or considered heavy in life, and you. You know, you know, you talk about it. Pareto's principle, and it's the 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm. You know, 80% of the people are going to be great in your life, mm -hmm. and 10%, you know, maybe the crabgrass that goes on the earth, you know, and another 10% you'll get rid of. And you know what? When you get rid of them, then another 10% is going to come in. And and here's what happens. If I had 100 patients come in in a day, okay. and 99 said, you are the best, and one said, you're the worst doctor I've ever been to, you hurt me. I used to focus on that one person instead of the 99 people that said something good. Isn't it crazy? Yeah, and that person could have won the lottery and they would complain about paying taxes. You yeah. Know? It, you know, someone licked all the red off their candy cane kind of thing, you know? Wow. So they'll never be happy. They're always focusing on doom and gloom. And we know people like that that have the perpetual clouds you, over you, their head. You take pride in seeing why they were unhappy, but you know 99 people are happy you're doing something right. Right. And, and the thing is, focus on what you can do and the people you can help your mm -hmm. tribe. It's and it's not everybody. Yeah, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Yep. You know, I can't help everybody. But there's people that I specialize in working with leaders and CEOs and and entrepreneurs that want to grow big businesses because mm -hmm. I've done all those. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the lane that I stay in. I know what my strengths are and I focus on them. And then what I do is I put a team together that can do all the things I can't do. So, you know, I always say, my kids will say, well, dad, you know, don't be that guy. And I say, no, I want to be that guy. And that guy is the person who's top of mind, the person who is the go-to person. So, you know, if someone says, you know, I'm going, I'm flying down to Florida or Miami, and they'll, and they'll say, oh, call Rick Goodman. He knows this. And if that person calls me, if I can help them, great. If not, I'm calling five of my friends, and they're going to be able to help and access you know, because it's about transforming your thinking, optimizing your assets, and accelerating your connectivity. Mm. You know, we got to think differently, and we have to think: what are our assets? Our assets are are the technology we know, our friends, people, our associates. These are all assets to us. And then we have to accelerate our connectivity. We've got to accelerate how much we engage with people and the speed at which we do business, because people want things done quickly. How would you say, you know, I guess speeding it up, it's I, I usually like to hear every part of the life, but because you, you you brought it up, how do you address that when it comes down to you're looking at you know, what you need? Meaning, for example, you said technology, like how do you address which technology you need? Like when you say we have access to these things, how does someone attack those things? They might know how to uh, what to do, but how to do it. Well, I don't think you have to know the how all mm -hmm. the time. True. And again, that's about putting a team together. I just had a conversation with a big construction company, and the CEO called me up, and she was just distressed she, about so many things. And I said, listen, the first thing you have to do is slow down to speed up. You know, we eat the elephant one bite at a time. So let's look at what is the first issue that we have to attack. And mm -hmm. the first issue is organization of the website. Everything else will fall into place after that, you know, marketing, stuff like that. But let's just look at doing the first step, then the second step, then cool. the third step. Most people were so used to multitasking and it doesn't work. You just get a lot of little things not done. You know, it's easier to focus on two to three things a day and that's it. Then you've accomplished your goals. Mm. You know, most people don't get, if they have a to-do list, they never get anything done. It makes them feel bad about themselves. So three things, your top three priorities a day will make you massively successful. You know, wow. if you improve 1% a day in 365 days, you're 365% better. You know? Ooh, I so like that one. Who wouldn't give you all their money to invest if you can show 365% return? And you know what? If you do something each day, something to improve yourself, something little, it doesn't have to be big, you know, you're going to break it down and start to see that you've achieved your goals. So you you would say you're a big believer in consistency. I will take persistence and consistency over talent any day of the week. Okay. You know, because so many people stop short of success and never know. And I was driving down one day, I was giving a seminar in Virginia. And if you've ever been in Virginia, the roads are so long and the exits are so far mm -hmm. away. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine from high school that my best friend and his dad and his dad's best friend went out on a boat on Jones Beach Inlet in Long Island. And the wave hit the side of the boat and my best friend and his dad's best friend went over the side of the boat and drowned. Mm. 
Mm. Well, as he told me the story, I was so shocked because I'd seen him a week before. I thought that was my exit and I got off the exit. Well, I started to turn around realizing I got off the wrong exit and I drove back in the other direction 45 minutes and then I realized I was going the wrong way again. I turned around and I went all the way back and what I recognized, I stopped 100 yards short of my exit. But it took me all the way out. But I thought of it as a metaphor that how many of us stop just short of success and we don't know because we quit, we gave up. We weren't consistent. We didn't move throw forward. It's no different than down here in Florida. You know, I see people when the rain, we have torrential rains, and they pull the side of the road. I keep going because you know what? A hundred yards later, it may not be raining because down here it could rain on one side of the road, not the other. But again, it's that metaphor that you mm. got to keep moving forward because what other choice do you have? What other choice do you have? Really, really, what other choice do you have? And it's funny you say that. It resonates with me. So I appreciate it. Is is I was someone who chose to, you know, I'm gonna sit down and not go forward. And I'll tell. I'll be the first one to admit. It does not help you. It would only make you not enjoy life and, and, and what it has to bring. The life is a journey, and you got to keep going forward no matter what. It leads me to knowing about more of your journey, Rick. If you know, I really want to understand. I know you became a big-time chiropractor, then you got into the professional um, leagues with it. Tell, I'm curious about that journey when you became a chiropractor after your first adjustment when mm -hmm. you wanted to become one. Well, it's kind of interesting because I, when I went to chiropractic school, um, I went to Logan in St. Louis. But before I even went there, I went mm -hmm. to a, a convention with my cousin. I worked in my cousin's office because I want to learn the business because most people don't know the business and they don't teach you business. They teach you how to treat patients. So I worked in his office and in Queens and we went to this uh, – college called Life College, and they had this DE convention, which was all about, you know, business and making money. And, and people there actually thought I was a doctor at that point. And I was actually kind of knowing how to adjust people even before I went to school. That's cool. Um, and when I went to school, as everybody was just learning and wanting to get A's, I recognized that the most important thing was how to run a business. So wow. I built my practice while I was in school. Mm -hmm. And then I went and worked for two of the top doctors. And I said, I'll be your slave. You don't pay me a penny. I just want to sit here and learn because I want to hear how they communicate with their patients what they said, how they did all these things again that they didn't teach you in school. So the day before I graduated, I had already purchased a practice and I already had made my first hundred dollar deductible in my pocket in 1988. The day before I even got my diploma, I had that someone deductible in my pocket and I drove to Jefferson City and picked up my diploma. So it probably wasn't too kosher at the time, but I was in practice the day after I graduated and all the rest of my class was figuring out what they wanted to be when they grew up. Mm, so I had I built, a curve like that. Yeah. So I built the practice very quickly mm -hmm. and then um, I ended up hiring a practice management person named Larry Markson who ended up being uh, one of my big mentors. And that's how I met your dad. Uh, I met your dad down at a seminar in Florida and I would take my whole team and there was training for the doctors on how to market and how to be better. And then mm -hmm. there was training for your staff. And again, it was going outside the box and training. And, and when I saw Dr. Markson up on stage and he would bring in all these other talented speakers, I said, I want to do that. So mm -hmm. one day I was tired of uh, coming to Florida and paying the money for my whole team to be here. And I said, how about I start a base in the Midwest? And he said, uh, you'll, it'll never work. You couldn't get the people there. And you tell me I can't do something. I'm going to prove you wrong. And he said, if you can get 25 doctors to move to the Midwest, I'll do it. And within about a half an hour, I had 25 doctors signed up and we started the Midwest base of Marks and Management Services in St. Louis. So now all my friends got to come and have breakfast at my house and I didn't have to get on a plane and go and I did that. And what was that exactly when you said the 25 chiropractors? What, what? 20, I, needed, I needed to get 25 chiropractors who were in this management group mm -hmm. to move and say and commit that they would go to the Midwest instead of coming down to Florida. And when you say go there to work? No, go there to attend the conferences. Oh, to so just attend the conferences. To attend, yeah, okay. because we would meet, I'd say it was probably four times a year. So instead of us having to fly down to Florida, pay for the team, you moved the my whole staff, I, I created a new location in the Midwest. And it eventually became the biggest location. 
So um, that way, and I, you know, for reasons that were a little bit selfish, I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to travel, you know, but it created a great base. And in fact, two weeks ago, I was in Nashville with Dr. Andy Dixon, uh, and he was one of the first doctors who moved from that base to uh, to the Midwest base. So just curiosity in the chiropractic space, so space, you went from running different offices, I know you played that, a time period doing that, to speaking, uh, or you did it at the same time, or well, to put on these events for these chiropractors to learn the business, which well, was in St. Louis. Right, that was, that was uh, kind of pre me speaking, although I was speaking all the time because one of the things they encouraged was to do healthcare classes, mm -hmm. and the first uh, speech I ever gave was to the, at the Working Woman Survival Show. Um, and the first time I ever was recorded, I said uh, 150 times in <laughs> five minutes. Um, and, See? you know, as you get better, you get better. So, mm. you know, what happened was I had sold my first practice because I decided I'd already done this. And I had gotten um, a job with a company called um, uh, AT&T. Mm -hmm. And they had this 1-800 Imagine line. So they had me working on developing this 1-800 Imagine line. And this is way before cell service was out there. And then another company called me and said, we'd like you to put together these uh, high performance work organizations. And it was another small company called McDonnell Douglas. So I went with them and Boeing through their merger and set up self-directed work teams throughout the whole complex. So I was working with the people making the Tomahawk missiles, the F-15 fighter jets, um, and breaking down the process for them and getting them all set up in them. And then they would come up with ideas on what were the best ways to do uh, the job. Because what we found out was the people who do the job know more than the people in what we called mahogany row, because they're on the floor there. So I set up a system of people coming up with different ideas, which ended up getting them bonuses, but saving millions of dollars in equipment by having better stuff. And I did that and, for a and while. And that was, you would say, your business acumen? that you were able to identify all this stuff? At I have the time? a talent for taking something difficult and making it simple. Mm. And I just can see that and see the structure and know what goes on. And it's because of, you know, I, I always say there's three stages. And the first stage and stage one is, you know, you're throwing things at a problem or you're butting heads and stuff. Stage two is you're trying to figure out what to do. And stage three, you're in the helicopter. And when you're in a helicopter, you could see down. So. For example, when they had the earthquake in Haiti, the first thing they did was everybody sent food to Haiti and all this. Mm -hmm. Now, all the food was sitting on the tarmac and everybody's in stage two and they're all arguing. Then what happened is the president sends in the Marines, they get up in helicopters and they can hover over the country and see the distribution sites and where people needed it and not so they can get the problem solved. It's the same thing here as an entrepreneur, as a business person. If you can get in that helicopter and you're looking down on the problem mm -hmm. and you're not in it, you mm -hmm. can now solve it. Because the challenge is emotionally getting yourself out of it because we react from emotion, but we respond from intellect. Mm -hmm. You know, So when you're not emotionally involved in it and you separate yourself, you can see it. And sometimes we can see problems and challenges in others or the solutions better than ourselves. You know, that's where a coach comes in because we're taking a different look from the helicopter versus being emotionally involved. In that. Yeah, that's what I've seen help me because I've worked with coaches before and, and they are like an extra brain. And you guys look at the the problem with another uh, perspective with experience and wanting you to win. And it's such a it's a great it's a teammate. And I really I really like that business. And I want to dive into that in a little bit. My question to you is my curiosity at it. You working with a professional sport team. You work with the St. Louis Rams? St. Louis Rams, Miami Heat, and the St. Louis Ambush. And what what was the job? Well, St. Louis Rams, I was one of the team physicians. So when I sold my practice, a friend of mine said, you should go back into practice. And I said, ah, I don't really want to do that. And my friend's the guy who coined the phrase, show me the money, Harold Lewis. He's a sports agent mm -hmm. who owns National Sports Agency. And he said, the Rams are moving from L.A. to St. Louis. You know, I can get you, you know, the whole bunch of people, patients, all this. And my parents told me the same thing, but they didn't send anybody. But this is Harold. So I literally, you know, started treating the, the players because I thought this would be cool. My son was five at the time. And Mike Jones was uh, on the foundation. Uh, I was on the board of his foundation. And I would speak for at his sports camps for kids during the summer. 
and Mike was a player who started out and went to Mizzou, uh, the University of Missouri. So he was kind of a local favorite, and and then he ended up going and playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, and he was the best, one of the best running backs at Mizzou. And they made him a linebacker, special teams, and he came came over, and we we bonded and became good friends through the foundation. Well, the third season in, the third season in, we're good, we're good. So the third season in, um, they went through a whole bunch of different uh, coaches and things, you know, weren't happening. And then they brought over Dick Vermeil. And Dick Vermeil was a transformational leader and, and a transformational transformational leader, someone who takes their vision, gives their people the tools, and supports their vision so they can accomplish their goals and objectives. Mm. And he was that kind of guy. He would embrace people. He'd invite people over to his house for spaghetti dinners, and he had his own winery and stuff. And he would cry all the time. Everybody loved him. So they they, they knew you can't sell what you don't own. And he loved these people. Well, Mike came in and we had gotten this new quarterback. His name was Trent Green. And he was supposed to bring us to the promised land. Mm -hmm. And the third game of the preseason, Trent Green went down with a season ending knee injury. And Mike Jones came in my office and the players would all come to my office around 630. And my son, you know, Rams Park was about 10 minutes away. And my son would be in the office so he could see all the players. And he came in the room with Mike and Mike said, you know, Doc, we're done. You know, we're going we're gonna to have another losing season. And, and they literally won the first four games when they moved from L.A. to St. Louis and then lost every single game. They were the worst team in the 90s. Mm. People forget this. Well, he came in. He said, we're done. We're going to lose and everything. And I snapped because you could take the New Yorker out of New York, but you can't take New York out of the New Yorker. <laughs> and I looked right at him and I said, if you can't, then you must. If you must, then you will. And he's like, what? And I said, I cannot have negative things in my office. This is a place of healing. I've got real patients here. So you need to make a decision. If you're not going to be positive, then you can't be a patient in my office anymore. And I walked out and my son looked at me and said, dad, are you crazy? He could kill you. He's a giant. And I said, Alex, I do a job. I treat players. He has a job. He's a football player. But we both put our pants on the same leg. Yep. We both put our pants on one leg at a time. We're the both same type of people. And if you don't speak your truth, you know, it's not going to happen. Well, fast forward, they get this guy named Kurt Warner. And Kurt Warner came off the shelves of stocking groceries. And the reality was not one coach wanted him except Dick Vermeil had this feeling, had this sixth sense. And I always call it it's like your gyroscope. It's when you went and took that multiple choice test and you went back and changed the answer. You always change it from the right one to the wrong one. Mm -hmm. And then you beat yourself up because you didn't trust your gut, your gut, your gyroscope. It tells you. And, and when you start to learn it, you get it. Well, his gut was that Trent Green, that Kurt Warner was going to take them to the promised land. He had a fast release. Well, the rest was history. All of a sudden, we became the greatest show on turf. Well, there was six seconds left in the Super Bowl. And the, and, um, the Tennessee Titans were coming down. They were getting ready to score a touchdown. They would have won the game. And... Uh, the quarterback dropped back to pass. He threw the ball to Kevin Dyson. And on the one-foot yard line, Mike Jones, my guy, made the winning tackle, one of the most famous tackles in history, known as the tackle. Well, the place went crazy. We won the Super Bowl. And three months later, my attorney calls me and he says to me, you know, we're going to – I said, my, my brother-in-law is a sports agent. Could you invite some of your players? We're going to have a golf tournament. I said, great. You even know – it." Bob Pollock, you even know him. So, and Bob has had a, a, I'd say he has no knowledge of sports at all. Zero, like less than zero. And he doesn't care. So he's got to go pick up some VIP at the airport. And he calls me up. He says, I got to go pick up some VIP at the airport. I don't know who he is. I, got, I go, what's his name? He goes, I don't know, some guy named Tommy John. I go, you're going to pick up Tommy John at the airport? I mean, World Series champion, Cy Young Award, New York Yankees, Tommy John underwear. Are you kidding me? I need to see this guy. You know, <laughs> I said, so me, you and Michael play together. And we're out there playing. And Tommy John was telling all these George Steinbrenner stories and stuff. And he finally looked at Mike. He said, what were you thinking, you know, when it was – you know, six seconds left in the game. And he said, you see this guy over here? This little guy, this guy is the most annoying New Yorker. He walks around and says, I can, I must, I will. He said, with six sec seconds left, all I thought was, I can, I must, I will. And when the whistle went off, I just bursted, grabbed them, and that was it. And then I don't remember a thing after that. And, you know, you never know when you're going to have an effect on someone, wow. say something that's going to change their path. And, you know, we all have people 
maybe it's our parents, a teacher. Somebody told us something yep. that is still in your head today. Yep. And it may have affected the path of your life. It may have stopped you from doing things, mm -hmm. or it may have encouraged you. And you remember that. I remember in my grandma's house being probably six years old, and all these older people, businessmen were there, and she said, you have two ears and one mouth to listen twice as much as you speak. And she said, you're going to learn a lot more about people in business if you're listening to them. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you what their needs are, what their wants are. And if you become a better listener, which I'm working at every day, I even have a post-it note in front, of my, in front of my computer that says, shut up and listen. And, and Rick, I, I really love that one you told me that in the beginning of the episode is that you always need to be learning and you're practicing what you're preaching right now. And you're so right with planting these seeds, especially that change people's lives, because in that moment, it, it, it really it, it's crazy. You know, and that was I, I think that's 2000. That was the 2000 Super Bowl. You're yeah, talking 2000, about? 1999, yeah, 2000. yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I saw that play and I saw a kid cry who was a Tennessee Titans fan because of that tackle. But that's crazy. I never even knew thought of that I would even hear that story in my life so that was fascinating well it's in you, and, you didn't read the book then I yeah, the first no, book no, living no, a championship I have not I, I mean look uh, it's I'll all say about it. that yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and and Rick is an author of two books three three books soon to be four well living a championship life Jamie's journey travels with my dad and the solutions oriented leader and now we're writing the adaptability zone achieving certainty in uncertain times so so let's I guess let's talk about that real quick you're an author you've created books you've wrote things to help people what what's it like to to be an author and any any you, uh you know it's funny when my kids say to me you know i i after my book was published and it went to number one on amazon and we have the solutions oriented leader podcast and <clears throat> now you know the solutions oriented leader mastermind that you and i were discussing the other day because the mastermind principle you know when you get two people like-minded people together it's like a step-up battery and and four and they help work on your business so we've got the solutions oriented leader mastermind for entrepreneurs or people that want to grow their business and it's like having your own board of directors there that want to help you to grow and I've had that my whole life and I've you know chosen what I call my personal board of directors people that I can call up and ask advice and and move myself forward and I think it's it's so important because being connected is what really grows your business mm -hmm. it's when we're disconnected is when we start to have fear which stands for false evidence appearing real mm -hmm. because most of the things you worry about never happen and uh, that's when we start to go in the opposite way so it's that connection as I said, in the transforming your thinking, optimize mm -hmm. your assets and accelerate your connectivity. That really counts. And when you wrote the books and you published them and they went on the internet and Amazon and created sales, what was it like like with people becoming so called fans? You know what? I I I still don't understand that people want me to sign my books. Um, although like I said, you know, when my kids asked me what I would sit there, I said, you know, I think I'm most proud to be called American author. And the reason being is, you know, there's over 680,000 books that are written every year and less than a half a percent are ever truly published. Not self-published because I've got a couple of self-published books and depending on what you want to use them for, uh, you know, but this one was published by a company called Sound Wisdom Books and they are the ones that do all the Napoleon Hills, all the Dale Carnegie books and, and several great authors like my friends Sam Silverstein and Shep Hyken and Simon Bailey. And they're really high, high-end publishers uh, doing the right thing. And so from my perspective to be in 250 Barnes and Nobles and, um, you know, companies buying 300 and 500 books at a time and, uh, you know, it's great because as long as they're using it, they're getting a lesson, it means I'm serving more people. Mm. And that's how we thats how we are successful. You're only successful if you're serving. Mm. You know, it's the way it works. No, thank you for those words. And and I actually would like to write some things that so-called publish or call it a book or an e-book. Because like you said, when, you, when you're giving as much as you can, it, it's serving people. And, and that's how life should be. Because when you're doing good, good things will happen. Because you're for humanity and i've seen that with you and it speeds up to something that i'm so inspired about was that you're considered a keynote motivational speaker talk to us a little bit about what you do in that space now well that space kind of closed down a little bit because of covid um but it, it's opening up again and and my biggest uh, love is getting up in front of thousands of people and sharing information and 
entertaining. And, you know, I say my, my programs all always bring three things. You know, they bring motivation, entertainment, and content and action steps that the audience walks away and can implement right away successfully. So, you know, that's what really gives me my juice is when, you know, people tell me something or... I had a speaker, a famous speaker's wife call me, uh, Dr. Willie Jolly. He's got a serious XM show and all this. And, and his wife called me up, D, and the first words out of her mouth was, Rick, you are so smart. And, you know, again, we all need affirmation. I was always told that I wasn't, you know. So when I, you know, woke <laughs> up the other day and someone sent me an email congratulating me, and I, frankly, I was in the bathroom looking at my emails, you know. <laughs> and I looked at it and I found out that I was number 28 in the world on the global guru list for leadership behind, wow. you know, with Tony Robbins and Patrick Lencioni and Ken Blanchard and John Maxwell and, you know, all these monster speakers, Cy Wakeman. And I thought, well, I guess someone thinks I'm smart. You know, so yeah. again, a lot of us are out there still mm. fighting those demons. Wow. You know, and we called it MFTP, mother, father, teacher, preacher. Those are people said children should be seen, not heard. Don't speak until spoken to mm. rich people, thieves, all the stuff that you believe that's absolutely not true. So you've got to change your references. And the only way you do is by learning, by watching podcasts like this, by connecting with other people that are growing and learning. And, you know, that comes to sometimes releasing people. You know, releasing friends along the way that don't serve you or don't serve, uh, you know, the purpose that you're on or going to sit there and tell you that you can't do it. Because, you know, will we say the top five people you spend the most time with is where you're going to end up with your money, with where you live, with the type of, you know, living you want to have. And, mm -hmm. and again, it goes back to choice. choice. It's really a choice. It's not what's happened to you. It's what you do with it that makes the difference. Mm. And so... How many countries have you spoken at? How many businesses have you worked? A little, I'm curious. I've done over a thousand programs in all 50 states, mm -hmm. and I've spoken in 26 countries now. And what's it like, like an event? How many hours? What's going on? You, you I, I, I heard the general, and I'm just, I'm just wondering how the detail works. Like, is it? an auditorium well there's a, there's a lot of preparation that goes in you know as soon as i start you know um i had a big city uh in the united states contact me today uh about coming out and speaking live so the first thing is going doing my homework so i go in i google i find out deep i want to know more about that client than they know about themselves because what you find out in some of these big companies is most people don't know what the company vision is, the mission, and the companies that really do well, everybody does. So, you know, there's a model that I can see right away. And then it goes into personalization. So I have a pre-programmed questionnaire so I can personalize it. I want to make sure to maybe, if it's depending on the type of meeting, to integrate stories about the people in the meeting. Before I'll do that, I'll, then I'll do a video, pre-conference video to get people excited about what we'll be talking about and get the participation up. And then when you get there, you know, a lot of it's about the sound team. I'm I am the big fan of the sound team because they make you sound good or bad. And frankly, there's a lot of speakers out there that are prima donnas, <laughs> you know, and they want the water at a certain temperature and all that. I'm not that guy. You know, I'm the guy who is the garbage man on the back of the truck. So mm -hmm. I know that everybody's important and the most important people are the people behind the soundboard. And I go right over to them and make friends with them and I bring them, you know, I'll give, bring them a gift certificate for something, anything that I can do, you know, to ingratiate and know that I'm on their side and I'm going to make their life easy. So I bring a lot of my own equipment. I'll have everything that's ever gone wrong at a conference I have in my bag corrections for. So whether it's different cords, whether it's my own, I bring my own mic that'll plug into their system. Uh, I bring in my own po uh, pointers and everything that could possibly be needed because most people don't do it. And mm. they instantaneously like you. And then, then it's about getting on stage and delivering. And really, if you've done your homework, you'll know the company and they'll feel like you really know them. You know, and then it's just about having fun because the easy part is giving the speech. Okay. The hard part is getting the speech. And that's really what it's all about. Mm. Same thing, you know, the easy part is, you know, enjoying some of the fun and signing those autographs, but the hard part is writing the book, you know, putting the time in, because that's, you know, that's the backstory. And when my daughter, you know, said to me, I said, you know, she said, you get paid 
tens of thousands of dollars to give an hour speech. It's crazy what people pay you. And I said, I'm going to show you something. And I pulled out a stack of 650 speeches that I did in every city in this country, big and small towns that you've never heard of, for $250 for the whole entire day and a $40 day per diem for food every single day and I speak for almost eight hours and I go to the next city and I remember driving through Jonesboro Arkansas and all I thought to myself was I was in triple-a ball you know I was in the minor yeah. leagues right now and I was doing what I needed to do I was going to play all those small towns yeah. until I could get into the major leagues and speak in front of thousands of people and and that's what it goes into you got to put the wood in to get the fire out Oof. nobody just got on stage and was amazing like yeah, you know, it doesn't happen like that. It doesn't. It, and, and that's where the backstory comes in. Mm. So when people see, oh, you've got all these things, and my daughter recognizes now because they have to put in the hard work too to get to where they're going. So it's mm. it's the same for everybody. You know, um, the person, if you're going to work a 40-hour week, you can't expect to be a millionaire. It's actually, I don't ever actually ask that question, but like, you know, from what you just said is, is so accurate you know and i've had all those experiences that you're saying is what's it like to have the millions that you've dreamed about you work so hard for and we know that money doesn't make you happy what what's it like when you when you actually attain the goals i can tell you that i always say money doesn't buy happiness it just gives you choices okay. i've had it my ex-wife took it all away from me i got it again but it, you know what it, it's just it's dead people on pieces of paper. It doesn't <laughs> fulfill you. It doesn't make you better. No matter what kind of money I had, it's I can't. I'm not going to have a better meal. You know yeah. all those things, and it really goes to priorities. True. You know what is your definition of success? You know I always heard the definition of success was you know the attainment of a worthy goal or ideal mm. was you know the journey. So how am I? I'm like any entrepreneur. When we complete something, there is a depression that hits because you did it you achieved your goal and then you go into now what so real entrepreneurs when you look at their journey yep. they get charged by starting that next project by doing that next thing mm -hmm. so when i kind of complete something is that sense of uh what now unless i'm speaking or something else i'm doing my podcast i'm doing but those are regular things it's like what's that thing that's going to give me that juice I had when I was 20 years old, that fire in my belly, you know, and most people coast and let that burn out and then they regress. But I like to, what, what's going to do that and what's doing it now? One is, is you being, you know, where I'm at, you know, in the building and helping you. And, and I've proposed to you a couple of real exciting ideas. And, and now we're also starting a um, speaker, a magazine called the thought leaders journal. So I'm going to have, you know, Tons of my friends from around the world are contributing editors. So, you know, people are going to be able to get a, a taste of everything because mm -hmm. my friends are, are why they don't just focus. They're not in leadership where I am. They may be in tech. They may be in finance or real estate. Or, they're all across the board in customer service and branding. So, you know, I want to have a magazine that is for people that want that knowledge and they want to see the top people and get that how to in one place. So I'm real excited about that. And that's great stuff. And it reminds me of a question I'd like to ask you is, you're someone who's highly connected. You know a lot of people. You've maintained a great reputation because you have great character. My question to you is, what's your take on relationships in life and business? You know, I got it. Well, first of all, if you give to get, you're even. Give to get, you're even. You give expecting nothing in return, you're ahead of the game. So, uh, you know, one is my brain works like that. So if you say, you know, do you know something here? My brain is going to go, who do I know there? Or or if you name, I'm going to Rio Doso, New Mexico. I'm going to go, oh, you <laughs> got to go past the statue. The horse is there. And there's this restaurant here called this. <laughs> and it's just how it works. I, I got a phone call from the president of Heineken in St. Martin. And he left me a message saying, I could put two people together that may live next door to each other and you're going to find out that their aunt's sister knows this and you're going to have like five degrees of separation before they even know it. And it's how my brain works. It's connections. It's because I first want to think, how can I hook this person up and help them? How can I put two people together? You know, what can I do to serve? And it's just the way it works for me in my brain and in, in 
connecting people that can help them out first. Mm. Because my friend Bruce Turkel wrote a great book called All About Them. And that's what it really is. You know, who's the most important person in the world to anybody is themselves. So if I focus on you, you like me. If I focus on me, eh, you know. So and, and it's not easy when you achieve things, too, to not want to share with people. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I had a phone call right before we started, and that's an individual who is a very high attaining superstar woman in business and makes a lot of money. But she finds herself not being able to have normal conversations about the things she's doing and attaining for other people thinking that it may be stuck up or, or bragging or whatever when that's just the realm of people that she's in. You know, it's mm. when, I, when I get together, my speaker friends at a conference once who were sitting down and said, what are you doing? He's, oh, I just got back from Singapore. Oh, I was in New Zealand last week and I just did this. And we stopped for one second and said, do you know, if people were sitting hearing us right now, they would think these people, the most stuck up, full of themselves people in the world. But this is our job. This is what we do. And for me, that's the juice is being able to go almost anywhere in the world and know somebody. <laughs> so and cool. be able to hang out with them or be able to call somebody when my SEO guy had gotten hurt. Um, when my SEO guy got hurt in, in Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge would bring him to Vietnam to this hospital, I called a speaker I knew in Vietnam that had seen me speak in the Philippines. And it just sent me something on Facebook when the pandemic hit. And he couldn't understand why people were on a food line with nice cars in the United States. And I had explained this just happened to them. You know, it was <laughs> sudden. Sneezed on the truth. It's good luck. And uh, I called him. I said, my friend's going to this hospital. He said, let me call a friend. We'll get him into a better hospital. My SEO guy, Anthony, calls me up. He said, how did you get the head of the BBC News and Sky News in Vietnam to get me to a better hospital and come here? And he was just, the, he's, the, he's the British guy. He's the head. Of, I didn't know he was the head of BBC News. But I picked up the phone. And I always say, if you don't ASK, you won't G-E-T. Mm. What's the worst thing that can happen? Someone says no, nope. and you're the same spot you were two seconds before. Yeah, yeah. They say yes, you went to the next level. And how many so times nice. have you asked somebody for something, and they said yes, and it blew your mind because you didn't think they say yes, and you couldn't <laughs> even believe it. And then you beat yourself up going, I'm such an idiot. I'm so stupid. Why didn't I uh, ask I'll, that before? I'll, I'll tell you what. I should have met you in 2017. That's crazy. You're so right. You're so right. I mean, it's it's you're an expert for a reason, but you, you know you just experienced in life, and you've you're giving us the secrets, and I, we appreciate it. Well, sharing is caring. Rick, you talked about the friends are that you hang around are very important. You have a lot of friends. Your circle. What do you consider the recipe for how you should be interacting with people as you're trying to reach your goals and you're maintaining friendships in life? I mean. The friendships I have, most of my really closest friends are in the business now because I like to surround myself with super smart people and thought leaders and, you know, because that's my path. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important that you have some people that you could share it with. In my book, Living a Championship Life, I have my goal setting formula. Mm -hmm. And what I talk about is, you know, there's going up goals and growing goals and going up goals you may uh, share with everybody. And that might be like you know, weight loss or stop smoking, but your growing goals, your personal goals, what you want to make, I only share those with certain people that fully support me 100%, mm -hmm. you know, because it, uh, some people say, well, you can't do that, like my family did, because that was their belief system. Mm -hmm. And so many people will go, oh, maybe they're right, and then they give up. Mm -hmm. So I only share my goals with people that fully support me, that are going to be my cheerleaders, that you can do it, you can make it happen, uh, because you need that support. You know, you need that, you know, on your journey, because as an entrepreneur, it's not easy. You're going to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, you're running your own business. Somebody's not giving you money as a salary, which makes you comfortable. You're uncomfortable. So, um, you know, that said, it, it really helps you kind of to hit your goals is the relationships that you keep, you know, and that's why, you know, Having a coach is so important. Having the support system of people who get you, you know, and you know that's why I like to go to my speakers conferences because I get together with four thousand people that are as crazy as I am. We all get each other, and I love that because uh, you know I know you and, and I get to you know learn from you now, which is an amazing thing. And I realize you're just a very happy person too. So like, where do you where does that like balance of life of work you know to a younger person? 
Now, what do you say when they're trying to balance that, trying to make, you know, business success, trying to, you know, meet new relationships and experience stuff and grow in life? What What's your take on balance and, and organizing that type in life? I think we're always trying to achieve it. We never get it. And, you know, frankly, when you're young, you got to put that wood in. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to establish yourself. And, and you know, it, it's when you've got that energy, that time and all that, um, and understand that if something doesn't work out, then you go to the next thing. It might not have been the right situation for you. You know, that's really what it boils down to. Um, it's not that, it you know, you didn't work. Maybe it was that wrong thing. It was the wrong fit. A lot of times I'll, I'll go into uh, a company and I'll, I'll move people around because I always think it's better to make the save than to go and find a new person because a new person is going to have to be trained. Someone's going to have to train them. It costs you money. They may not work out, etc. But sometimes you could move somebody lateral and all of a sudden it matches their personality because I hire based, people based on their personality styles, not their talent. They've got to all be talented. But I know that certain positions have certain personality yeah, styles, know. and I need to make sure because, one, I don't want to mess up the chemistry of an existing team. But more important, that person, based on their personality style, may not work well in that job. Yeah. You know, you're not going to put me in a job or a position ever that is so analytical and detailed because I'm a creative expressive driver that's my personality style i set up checklists and all that for the details because it's not something that i'm good at i leave the details to the other people Mm -hmm. it goes back to the highest and best use what are your strengths what are your talents and focus on that and then surround yourself with people that fill your void of the talents you don't have to help you get to where you need to go one question about life is that purpose do you have that defined for you I think I've always have it. I think I've got a higher purpose to just help people. I haven't figured it out yet. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's through me or through my children or it's through my books or it's through what they're doing because they're doing amazing things. So, I, you know, I just keep going forward. And I've felt this way for 30 years that there's something important I'm supposed to do. I don't really know what it is, but I just keep doing. And maybe I've already done it. Maybe I'm not done doing, but it, maybe I've mm-hmm. done it already and I don't know it yet. Do you have like one, where you could define, you know, I know you have many, but like one of the coolest experiences in your life where you're like, you really just kind of like had a big smile, like this is the coolest experience, maybe besides the birth of your children? What, what would... I can tell you exactly. It was, I was speaking at the Global Speaker Summit in Auckland, New Zealand. And the Global Speaker Summit is 500 of the top people around the world, and they all think they should be on stage instead of you. And I was one of the keynoters there. And for two days, I listened to everybody bash Americans. And I didn't want to be the ugly American in another country either. So I was just sitting there taking notes. And one guy, he got up there and talked about how he made money in the middle of the night and everything. And and he was kind of pompous. And then there was another guy who got up, and uh, his name was Frederick Heron. And he's an unbelievable speaker. He's coached thousands of speakers around the world, a super talented guy. And he said, you know, well, what would happen if you were on stage and something happened to a celebrity? Let's say Michelle Obama. When Michelle Obama was elected prime minister of the United States, what would have happened if something happened to her? Well, I'm writing this stuff down because this is great material. So I got up on stage and my program was about sharing the pie because the the process, the, the thought process based by this guy, Cabot Robert, who started the National Speaker Association was make the pie bigger so everybody could eat from the pie. My philosophy is the pie is big enough. I want to share some pie. So if I can't help you, I'm going to call my friends. I have a, an Internet company. I have a bunch of them. But the main one, Advantage Continue Education Seminars, does continue education for attorneys, accountants, construction, legal, anything where someone needs a license to keep keep you know, get credits for their license we're in that business so most a lot of the faculty are friends of mine and they're in the room so i got up on stage and i started talking 10 minutes in my microphone went completely dead now i'd seen speakers before where their powerpoints went dead or something and they started looking at their powerpoints and and they just failed and i always say that when mick jagger and keith richards are up on stage rolling stones when keith richards plays a long note you never know. He doesn't stop. He just keeps going. Uh-huh. You don't know he played the wrong note unless you are a musician yourself and have an amazing year. That's the reality of it. 
So nobody knows, so you just keep going. Well, I went New York on the crowd and I started shouting at the top of my lungs so loudly that everybody could hear. Then the AV guy came up, stuck his hand in my pants, and as he had his hand in my pants, I had my arms out to the side like this, like I was being fricked by TSA. I did not stop talking for one second. When the microphone came back on, and fortunately, we were Facebooking it live. So we were streaming it, so we were able to capture the audio. Otherwise, it would have been 10 minutes of dead audio, you know, just maybe faintly hearing me screaming. The place went crazy. I looked at the audience, all speakers, and I said, we're professional speakers. This is what we do. I said, you could take the New Yorker out of New York, but you can't take New York out of New Yorker. Place went crazy. And then I said... You know, Gil, I said, you know, you've been making money in the all night. I said, I make money laying on the beach in South Florida sharing my friends. And I named all my friends in the audience are on the faculty. And I said to Frederick, I said, Frederick, I must be working too hard. I said, because I missed the election when Michelle Obama was elected prime minister of the United States. Well, the Aussies, the Brits, the U.S. people were going nuts because it was funny, but it wasn't painful at him. And afterwards... The testimonial that Frederick Heron gave me after I kind of, you know, socked him a little on that dig was amazing. And he said, you know, this is a man that doesn't speak from the mind. This is a man that doesn't speak from the brain. This is a man that speaks from a heart, a heart that's raw, you know, and real, real. He goes, I'll remember this forever. And then he invited me to stay at his guest house in Singapore when I stayed there. And I remember getting on that stage with the place going nuts. People were talking about it for days because... What would you do if your mic went dead? I have seen speakers cry on stage. I have seen big peak speakers completely fail on stage. And it's that's not happening in, in my world. So I, I just that. went forward. And, and that was absolutely the best, better mm -hmm. than anything, just because it was in front of my peers, the toughest audience on mm -hmm. the planet, because they all think they should be up there instead of you. And, and so many speakers I knew that never, there was friends with that never ever saw me speak. And so many testimonials were, I've never seen Rick speak, you know. And even the last one was a guy who owns a company called eSpeakers, which is a, a big kind of a bureau, CRM for speakers. And he said, saw this Rick last night, blew me away. I could watch him again. It was amazing, you know. And to have those accolades coming from your peers, that was pretty much at this point. With the exception of, I don't know, walking into uh, when I was at Pembroke Pines Mall and I was looking for my friend's book, uh, you know, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, okay, Coach Goldsmith. And certainly I get the book and I said, do you have the Solutions Oriented Leader? And right there at 1130 at night, they brought my book over to me, which wasn't supposed to be released for two weeks. And I'm FaceTiming it live. And the girl who designed the book cover, she is in town to help launch the book from the Philippines. And she sees her book cover in a bookstore for the first time in her life live. That was super cool. Wow. Oh, I know you have stories. So we're going to have to do a part two, Rick, because I want to keep digging into your stories. I guess my remaining questions for you would be, and I appreciate your time and coming on the show today. You say that you're a serial entrepreneur. How many businesses do you have? Let me think. Uh, I'd say, well, this is eight internet companies, uh, about 10. Awesome. And, and it's just so cool to see because, I mean, it you need a corporate chart, basically, to figure it out sometimes. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, we, we'll dive in in other episodes of how you actually run 10 businesses. I'm sure you're not day-to-day -day with them all, but you're overseeing um, what your investments or uh, how you play your role in each of them. So it's so interesting. So I guess my ask is maybe tell us some more wisdom that you want to share, who you are, you know, what you're offering now how people could find you, and just the message that you're spreading day to day. Mm -hmm. I think really for your audience, people that want to grow, people that want to become millionaires at some point, people that are just not uh, knowing what they need to do first, second, or third, the, 
two best things is one is our coaching program, you know, individualized coaching. Mm -hmm. And the second is the solutions oriented mastermind. And what the solutions oriented mastermind is, it's a 12 week program uh, where you're in with a, another group of entrepreneurs. We keep it small. And what everybody does is we help them to work on their business, their business goals. Mm -hmm. And what you end up happening is you end up forming a, a, your own personal board of directors in this group because the total group uh, goal of the group is to uh, help you to get where you want to go faster. Mm -hmm. And I like to have diverse groups. So there's people from all different types of businesses because they have a different perspective than mm -hmm. people that are solely in your business and have only one way of looking at a problem. Remember, we want everybody getting up in the helicopter. And we found that those mastermind groups, and I've been a part of mastermind groups for years, uh, just help people to, one, generate an, an awesome return on their investment. But more importantly, uh, not have to go and suffer some of the mistakes and failures that they would have doing it on their own. Um, and that's what I always say, you know, my organization, you know, when I'm at the Speakers Association, it's like getting a two-year college education in six months. You know, that's why I advocate listening to audios and videos. Almost everything I've ever learned has been sitting in my car because you spend so much time in your car. And I used to say to my mother, if I knew my schoolwork like I knew my music, I'd be a straight-A student. Now I listen to all that stuff because you know all the words of your favorite songs and all that, but you can't remember who the king of Mesopotamia was, you know, as if it makes a difference in your life. But now I know my schoolwork, so to speak, like I know my music because I'm hearing it over and over again. I do my affirmation every morning that I've been doing for 30 years. You know, I do it on stage. Which one is that? I'm a healthy, vital, active, happy, and successful human being. I affirm today that all tissues and organs in my body are functioning perfectly, and that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm more relaxed than before because I choose peaceful, loving thoughts and release my fears, worries, and anxieties. Tension is gone because I'm creating an atmosphere of ease and confidence. My mind is uncluttered because I set specific goals and plan action steps for their accomplishment. I feel better now. Nature uses the food that I eat, the air that I breathe, the water that I drink, and the rest that I get to rebuild, repair, and revitalize me for the future. Radiant energy flows through me. I also affirm today my money is plentiful and an abundant supply and this money flows freely and constantly into my life as i render loving service to all mankind amen that's what i said oh, wow and you know what do you say well, it's gonna be one of those days and then at the end of the day you know because you had a mom or grandma that said bad things happen in threes and your brain was going on the road to make you right and you go soup i knew it was gonna be one of those days like What'd you get for being right? Mm, you know, so it's where secret, you focus. Yep. It's when you buy a new car and suddenly you see everybody on the roads driving the same car. You know, you never notice for it. Your brain's going on search to make you right and go, hey, that was a smart move. You know, so w would you say that's, you know, the popular word I bring up on these episodes is manifestation? Oh, attraction. Law of attraction. Completely. And, you know, you, you know, some of my friends make fun of me, but I call them welcome to my life moments. And when I see my kids having them do the same thing, I say, this is a welcome to your life moment. You know, it happens to me all the time where all of a sudden I meet somebody and boom, you welcome know, it's like life. this happens all the time to me, you know, you know <laughs> I mean, like I got a call from the head of uh, the city planner from Paulson, Montana to see if I would come out there 10 minutes. That's why I was a little bit late on the on the phone call. And he said, he, I, I said, you got a 305 area code. He said, I'm moving from from here to Paulson, Montana, would you like to have breakfast at Lulu's this Saturday in Coral Gables? Welcome to my life. Well, we'll wrap up the episode with what's the Rick Goodman vision? What, what can we see the next decade out of Rick Goodman? What, what, what are you seeing? I see me being on more stages, uh, helping more people, you know, one-on-one -on -one to help grow their business, mm -hmm. you know, maybe helping people to, you know, getting them into sort of speak an incubator and they have their ideas and let's mm -hmm. see, you know, if these ideas work, you know, I, you know, you say, how do you do a lot of these things? A lot of my stuff I've automated, you know, I have like a, when we built a neurology associates group and I came down here, we had two clinics, I built 13 and the whole theory was in my theory was the McDonald's or, or Burger King. I wanted them to all look the same, feel the same. So we're Fridays and you go to TGI Fridays, you know where the bathroom is. Because it's in the same spot in every TGI Friday. So what people know what to expect. So they feel comfortable. So that's how we set up the clinics the same way as they all looked, smelled, you know, same colors, all that theme. And, and it's the same for your business. It goes back to branding so that people don't get a mixed message that they know this is the problem that you solve because people pay. You know, they want four things. They want pain relief. They want solutions, results, and they want to know how long it's going to take.
You know, that's really what it, what it comes down to. Well, you want to say any parting words to the audience? I guess the only parting words is, you know, if you'd like to connect, uh, you can connect with me, Rick at RickGoodman.com. Or, you know, if you're interested in the Solutions Oriented Mastermind, just go to SolutionsOrientedMastermind.com, uh, you know, sign up, register, ask a question. We're going to be kicking one off uh, in the next month. And uh, that's what we have. That's what's going on. And I you can look it. for the adaptability zone. And uh, that's rickgoodman.com also. And solutions oriented mastermind. mastermind.com. At Rick Goodman on Instagram. Yeah, connect me on Instagram, LinkedIn. YouTube, LinkedIn. Uh, and, you know, if you WWRD and you're watching this podcast and you mention the podcast only, Ooh. and I say, wonder what would Rick do? If you have a challenge, if you overcome something, if you give me something specific, I will get back to you in 24 to 48 hours to help you only if you put in that you were listening to this on the Millionaire Voices podcast. Wow. Well, thank you for that blessing. I'm definitely going to market that. I'm definitely going to let people go ahead and reach out to you because if you guys want free really really valuable information and wisdom i would go ahead and take that offer so thanks so much rick i really appreciate you coming on this show Thank man it was an honor me. it uh it really I'm, i want to have a part two because i want to keep talking and asking you stories but i'm looking forward to the future i'm looking forward to working with you i'm looking forward to seeing how you're going to help the world and i know you're going to do it so let's just take it to the top is which my, my mantra is sounds and, good and uh We'll talk soon. I always say keep making it happen. Keep making it happen. There you go.